Hello there, Glenn Scrivener from Speak Life, and we're doing Reading Between the Lines through the Bible, a phrase each day. Please do join us, especially in 2016, we'll be blogging uh, a phrase each day, uh, thinking about the Bible, the plot line of the Bible, and how Jesus is at the center. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, we are Speak Life UK there, and you'll get these daily thoughts in your feed. Our uh, thought for Christmas at the moment, I think this is our sixth Christmas thought, uh, it is uh, away in a manger. Our phrase for today is away in a manger. And I'm just going to read from Luke chapter 2, uh, 1 to 7, verses 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Here is a passage that begins with Caesar sitting on a throne, and it ends with Jesus born in a manger. And really, it just completely inverts all our ideas of power, really. Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man in the world. And then uh, we end with this most defenseless, speechless, weak baby wriggling around in a manger because there's no room for them in the inn. Uh, you might think that here is one with all the power at the start and here is one who is utterly powerless at the end, but you'd be entirely wrong. Uh, Caesar Augustus uh, seems to issue this decree, but really he's a puppet on a string. Because the whole Roman Empire is being upended so that Joseph can return to the town of David and Jesus can be born in Bethlehem. That's, that's why the entire world is, get turned, is getting turned upside down. You think Caesar's in control? Caesar is not in control. You know who's in control? It's the baby in the manger. Um, this is something that Luke does all throughout the Gospel. And so, you know, by the time you get to the end of the Gospel, you know, you have, you have Jesus in front of Herod or Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate on trial. And it looks like Jesus is the victim. Jesus is the accused. Jesus is the powerless one. But actually, Herod and Pontius Pilate are doing only what God's forethought and, and, and plan had in mind for millennia um, gone past. You know, the ones who look like they're in power are actually under the power of the one who looks so weak, the one who is the victim in all this. What kind of victim is this? The victim who is actually the Lord. An incredible inversion of power. But before we go on, let's just say one thing about the census. In verse 2, uh, there's a census that took place while Quirinius was governor of, of Syria. And uh, people have looked at that and said, Ah, but we haven't found any extra biblical sources that, that actually back up that there was a, a census at that time. There was another census at another time, but there's no you know, records of a census in this time. But hang on, only 1%, probably less than 1% um, of you know, the ancient histories of the first centuries have been preserved to this day. 99% have been lost. Here is one history that says there was a census. And uh, Luke proves himself as an excellent historian. You can just read the first few verses of chapter 1, first few verses of chapter 2, first few verses of chapter 3. And we see what an excellent historian Luke is. He names names, geographical locations, figures of history, gets them all right. Uh, he's writing excellent history. And he tells us that there was this census. Now, if he was making it up, it would completely undercut his story because he's saying, look, this, this is true and historical and factual stuff. And to invent a census that never happened within the lifetime of those who would have lived through it is absolutely nuts. Can you imagine if I was writing a history of the, the 1970s and I said, uh, oh yeah, you remember how everyone in Scotland was required to go and live in Wales for three years? Do you remember that? Instantly, you discredit yourself. Luke is not going to do that. So anyway, that, that's just a sidebar. Anyway. Here we've got this issue of the one who has all the power, the Lord Jesus Christ, looking like he's the one who is weak, and the one who has all the power, seemingly Caesar Augustus, being actually the impotent one. Um, and yet, here is the way true power operates. It doesn't operate by clinging on to a throne. It operates by making itself small, making itself vulnerable, giving itself for others. That's what true power does. Because think of the Lord Jesus. You know, he was the one person in history who ever got to choose to be born. Um, 
He got to choose how he was born. He got to choose to whom he was born. He got to choose where he was born. And if you had the choice that Jesus had, would you have chosen what he chose? Most of us would have chosen to be in Caesar's household. What's astonishing is that for Jesus to choose to be in Caesar's household, that would be a come down. That would be a massive climb down. For all eternity, Jesus has been in the bosom of his father, as the old King James Version translates uh, John chapter 1 verse 18. Jesus has been surrounded by the worship of a hundred million angels. Even coming down into Caesar's household would have been a climb down. But think of where he climbs down to. This Joseph and Mary, this teenage couple, absolutely penniless, poor, born into an oppressed nation, born into the most despised part of that oppressed nation, born under the, the insinuations of everybody that he is a bastard child. And that, that, and that, is, that is the slander that he's born under, you know. Jesus chose to make himself very small. And, and think of where he is laid in verse 7. He's laid in a manger. You know what a manger is? It's a feeding trough. And he's born in Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? It's a Hebrew word, Bethlehem. It means house of bread. So here is the Lord Almighty, born into the house of bread, born as bread, born as food for the world. And how is the world going to feed on Jesus? Well, how does bread get eaten? It's, it's first got to be torn apart. It's first got to be broken into pieces and made available to others. What does the powerful Lord Jesus do but stoop down even to the manger, to the feeding trough? And he will stoop even further to the cross where he is torn apart, where he is broken apart for you to feed you. This is what the true God is like. If you want to know who God is or what God is like, don't look to earthly power and then ramp it up and think that's what heavenly power is. Don't look to Caesar to give you your picture of God. Look to the manger to give you your picture of God. This Christmas, see what true power looks like. It looks like the strong making himself vulnerable for you. I'm just going to finish with uh, some lines from Martin Luther, a Christmas sermon uh, that he preached 500 years ago. Luther said this, Reason and will would ascend and seek above. But if you would have joy, bend yourself down to this place. There you will find that boy given for you, who is your creator, lying in a manger. I will stay with that boy as he sucks, as he is washed, as he dies. There is no joy but in this boy. I know of no God but this one in the manger.